Hello and welcome to the Future Tech Talk podcast. I'm your pilot, Nolan Michaels. I think this is episode 30 and that's a bit of an accomplishment, so thank you to everyone tuning in. It means a lot to be able to share some thoughts with you once a week. Big shout out to my boy Planty back here, bringing the photosynthesis to the party. Couldn't have done it without you. It is a another cloudy gray day down here at the ballpark maybe not cloudy and i know it might look bright i'm sitting in front of a window but it is white outside the sky is gray not gray it's white there's no blue to be found it is the opposite of a happy sky but you know we've survived another winter almost and i think our ancestors would be proud of us for that it's an accomplishment to get through winter Unless, of course, you live somewhere warm, like maybe on the equator, then getting through winter really is sort of trivial and, (laughs) you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal to you. But for a lot of people, for the history of the world, getting through January is an accomplishment. The days are getting longer, and that's something to be proud of. So if if you got nothing else going for you, at least you got that. Maybe we can start first by talking about the Consumer Electronics Show, CES. Now you might think from a future tech-based show that I would want to have a recap, I'd want to rehash everything that was shown off there, and the truth is I, I don't, I never want to be that guy, I don't want to be the news, but I will say that it would be really cool to be at that show live someday. I think I'd have a lot of enthusiasm for seeing all that technology in person, but from the outside, oh, it's just, it is so silly. It's so impractical and so unnecessary. A lot of the things that get shown there, it's just such a hype fest. Like, sure, you can get a foldable TV, but, you know, I often talk about how boring reality is. and like, you're going to have to clean that thing. It's going to get dusty. It's... <laughs> Why would you ever wait for your TV to get unfolded when you could just watch a normal screen? Like, it's just a party trick. And I don't want to knock what they do there because that's how you spur innovation. You you throw on a party trick and you see what connects with people. And I think what they do at CES is probably a good thing for society as a whole. It's just, uh, <laughs> I just, I don't want to buy into the hype too much. But I did see this one product. I don't know if it's like a backrest. I don't know how you would describe it. But I think it goes on the back of your office chair. Not the back of it. It sits between you and your office chair. So you like sit on this thing. I think it goes under your butt. And it goes up your back as well. And it's like a haptic feedback pad or something. And this is obviously used for gaming. But then I'm thinking like, how would it know what haptics to provide me maybe there's like an hdmi pass through but even so how would it know where to bring the rumble and like if you were playing call of duty or something and you got shot on your left side like it would only appear to hit you from the back like how would it it's not a full body thing so what if something happened in front of you how how would you get that sensation i really don't know how this thing would work (laughs) but maybe it could be used for driving a driving game and you could feel the bumps and and the rumble of the road that might be pretty cool but why would you want that when you're playing a game maybe immersion is the the number one go-getter goal of these companies but immersion sounds good from a marketing perspective but when you're playing it what do you what do you want i don't know i feel like people want to relax (laughs) most of the time when they're playing a game. However, I will say that when I was like 14, I remember lying in bed and I had the best idea ever. I was thinking, what if there was like a vest or kind of a an armor suit you could wear? Maybe that's not the best way to describe it. Maybe it's more like football equipment or hockey equipment, something you would wear on top of your clothes on top of your body. And it would have haptic feedback. If you were playing Call of Duty or Gears of War, I'm pretty sure is what inspired this idea. And you got shot on the left side, you would feel it on your left side. And I remember, you know, maybe six years later, I'm like 20 years old. And I remember thinking, oh my God, that is the worst idea I've ever had. I can remember vividly when I was 14 
It was the best idea I had ever had. I couldn't believe it. Then sure enough, a few years later and now 12 years later after that, I can confidently say that's one of the worst ideas ever. Who would want that? Imagine you're playing a game with your buddies and you get shot and you start screaming over the mic. Like, ah, they got me. <laughs> your friends are like, what are you doing, man? Like, why are you role playing so hard? And you're like, no, it hurts. They really got me. Like, what if you were in a gunfight and you got shot like on your left side and you dropped the controller because it was, you were in pain and now you can't fight back? Like, such a good idea. Best idea my 14 year old brain had ever had. I was convinced. I'm like, everyone would you, it would be the best. Who wouldn't want to use this? And sure enough, I flip flopped pretty hard on that. Who would ever want to use that? Why would anyone want to subject themselves to pain? Is that the right way to say that? Why would you ever voluntarily feel pain while you're trying to play? Like, do you know how rewired your brain would get if your relaxing video game time was more than just, you know, screaming at other people and now your body really thinks that when it associates this game that it can visually see with real pain? You're never going to want to move around the corner. You're you're going to camp so hard. And then imagine you get sniped or something and it's just doosh. Okay, like that, that idea is so cool. But reality is not based in your ideas. Reality is so different. And translating an idea to reality is a real skill. It's something more than just saying it. Like the best ideas often don't make any sense in the real world. Why would anyone ever want that? I know last week I was crying about upgrading my computer and just being worried that the new thing is going to be announced. And NVIDIA did announce some new GPUs with some pretty bad naming. They called it the Super, but like it's not it's not a new series. For a few years they had the 30 series, so 3070, 3080, 3090. Then like last year or in 2022 they came out with the 40, 40, 70, 40, 80, 40, 90. I don't know if we were supposed to be expecting a 50s, 50, 70, 50, 80, 50, 90, but they didn't do that. They came out with like side upgrades. I think they're upgrades, but then I'm not even sure the specs. Okay. The price point is not super increased. They they came out with like the 40, 70 TI super, something like that. Like it's, it's, the 40 series, but just, I think, better. But again, the price point is, like, less than the original price point. So I don't... Anxiety is a good word to use around upgrading your computer, but confusion is a better word. The way these companies market their products in terms of branding, it's it's not good. And I'm sure they run tests and market research, and I'm sure to their core fan base these things might click. But even then, you read some comments online and one of the first things that get brought up is, what do you do? Why are you calling it the super? Like, if it's different, call it something different. And if it's the same but better, I don't know. May ah, see, maybe they did the right thing. It just reminds me of, like, 10 years ago, maybe a little more than that, it was the Xbox 360 versus the PS3. Everybody knew that we would get a PS4. That's made a lot of sense. PlayStation 1, 2, 3, 4, now we're on to 5, probably going to see a 6. Xbox started with just Xbox, then it went to 360, and this was sort of an artistic name. It That one word, that one little phrase, sure it's just numbers, but 360 reminiscent of 360 degrees, it's full circle, It's it means a lot more than, than just the letters or numbers that it technically represents. What are they going to name the next Xbox? A lot of people said Xbox 720. Like, yeah, haha, that's that was probably brought up in a boardroom and then denied because if you're going to go with the 360, you're probably open to other interesting ways of naming things. You, you could call it the Xbox Oasis for all we know. Like, it, it could have been... You probably were you probably were going to keep it short, but again, you, you could have chosen any archetypal name that represented and meant more than 
the single word, and I think people would have rolled with it. But they went with the Xbox One. And I remember people being like, that's an odd name. It's not the first Xbox. Technically, it's the third Xbox, and you're calling it the One. And this is a really classic case of marketing competition where if company A is on the fourth edition of their thing, company B does not want to name their product anything less than four. Because if you're on your third and they're on their fourth, consumers at large, the most broad base, is going to think four is better than three. So you don't want to number yourself at a lower number than your competition. So even though Xbox was on three and PlayStation was on four, oh, is that why they chose the Xbox 360? Because of the PlayStation 3? Like, that is the kind of stuff that gets thought about. And they came out with the Xbox One. O-N-E. One. Maybe the one, maybe if it was like W-O-N, that, that would have been better. Not good, but better. They came out with the Xbox One when the PS4 was launching. Like that, you're just kicking yourself. <laughs> I'm kicking my own ass. <laughs> Shout out to Liar Liar. Big Canadian Jim Carrey movie. And then, the I'm just going to rant about this for a bit. Then Xbox goes into, the PS5 gets launched. Announced. Xbox announces theirs. And they split the skew into two. Which is already a crazy idea. It's like some Apple stuff. Like, I think it was like the iPhone SE was like maybe launched alongside other iPhones. Nonetheless, Xbox came out with the Xbox Series S, which is like the lower price point version, and the Xbox Series X. And it's just like, do you hear yourselves? Series X? Xbox? Xbox Series S? No, Grandma. I asked for the X, not the S. Like, just... <laughs> okay, you know what? Let's talk a little bit about Mid Journey. Office Hours was held every week, as they do, and he gave us maybe a bit of foresight into the next four weeks. The main thing that they're working on, well, this isn't exactly accurate, but they are working on a consistent style feature where you can input a style. Maybe that's like a color combination or thick versus thin brush strokes, something along those lines. And you'll be able to set that as the style and have every picture you generate after that follow that style makes sense but in tandem they're also working on a character consistency feature and it will work something like you input a character and then you'll give it a name a trigger word and every time you want to see that character you'll input that trigger word in your prompt and your character will appear now i get the sense that character consistency is a little more difficult and it's slightly behind the style consistency However, they still are thinking about launching them alongside each other. Long story short, I think if Mid Journey is able to nail character consistency in the way that its users think about it, the way that we envision it and the way we imagine it and the things that we want from character consistency, if it's able to do that, I think it will be the biggest change in visual storytelling history. I cannot imagine a single artist who wouldn't use it. I think traditionally, not that I really know, but I get the sense that consistency is one of the hardest things to pull off in visual arts, especially when you have a large team. Maybe you're the director and you have 10 different artists. You need these animation and sprite sheets, these different models of how the character looks in different situations. You have to teach people frame by frame how characters are supposed to look, anatomy by anatomy, piece by piece. If you were able to teach a robot that, mid-journey, the robot, like, mid-journey is the best. It's just, it's not, it's not really a competition between, okay, first of all, it's the best, and it's the fastest. You pay for their servers. They have the sickest servers. Stable Diffusion is amazing. You can run these models for free on your computer. Do you have a computer that can run a Stable Diffusion model? Probably not. That's like a... $1,500 to $3,000 GPU you're going to need, and then you're going to have to learn how to make it work. And I'm telling you, it's not easy. It's not simple. You can learn. There's a lot of help out there, but like you can also learn 
particle physics and quantum mechanics, you can learn those things. Doesn't mean it's easy to do. I'm not saying stable diffusions on that level. My point is just because you can learn about it doesn't make it easy. Mid journey takes care of all of that for a monthly subscription. You don't have to worry about power. You don't have to worry about pipeline. It creates the best images. It it's been trained not to create bad images. You have to manipulate the machine to create ugly things. That's amazing. It's fast. Within a minute, you get four pictures. On some versions, it's within 30 seconds. They even have a turbo mode you can pay for. Okay, my point. If mid-journey, the best AI model, can come up with a feature for character consistency, I, I, think, I think it'll be the biggest update slash change in, in storytelling. But I will say... I'm not confident they're going to pull it off. And that comes from my my interpretation of their intent. And I don't think their intent lines up with what we want. When people say character consistency, and you know what? Let me just point this out. When David is talking in the office hours, he'll bring up the point that, well, what do you mean by character consistency? Does that mean an object? Is a character an object? He'll throw out the question like, what does it mean for a consistent character? And I think the audience has been a little confused by that because it, it seems like an obvious answer. Character consistency refers to more than one thing. A, it refers to face and body features, body proportion. Face, ears, hair, length of arms, length of body. And then you'd be able to take that consistency and place armor on top of it, a police uniform, a suit. You'd be able to get your character in a bunch of different situations. But there's a second part of character consistency, and that refers to details of what they're wearing. A character who's already wearing an outfit that's famous for their outfit. Maybe it is a police uniform that has a specific looking badge with the number above it. A specific color of blue, a specific tie, a specific belt with the buckles and the pant loops that always stay in the same spot. Like, you want that exact character to be able to rotate and stand to the side, turn around, face the camera, and have the details all show up at the correct angle. I'm pretty sure 99% of people would agree with me that's what we want. In terms of character consistency. Now I don't know if that's entirely feasible. Maybe that's really difficult to do. But I also just don't get the sense that that's what they're going to try to do. I also think character consistency does refer to objects. If you created your own uh, perfume bottle. And you wanted to do a photo shoot. An advertising photo shoot for that perfume bottle. You would ideally... Input it into mid-journey, present it, save it as a trigger word, and then you'd be able to get that perfume bottle any single time you wanted. You just say, dash dash perfume bottle sits on the left side of the bar. Dash dash perfume bottle is buried in the sand on the beach. And instead of a perfume bottle, it's going to bring up yours. Same curves, same color, same lid. That's what character consistency means. And if that was possible... That would change everything. There are services who can bring a consistent model into different pictures. But if Midjourney can do that and do it with the promise that everyone hopes for, I think, oh, not only would it inspire a lot of people to create consistent art as in a story, a cohesive story, it's going to allow people already looking to do that. They're going to be able to do it inside of mid journey now again i just don't i just don't think it's going to meet our expectations in some weird it's like something's not going to go right like maybe if you can get a consistent character it'll still be hard to get a consistent scene can you get more than one consistent character per scene that would be amazing if you created a scene inside of mid journey this is just a potential workflow i'm thinking you go into photoshop and you crop out and mask each item you save those items as pngs or whatever you feed them back into mid journey wait what pictures it's a teddy bear with some writing on it okay you take those individual objects you feed them back into mid journey then would you have to re-describe the scene 
Like saying, oh, the red mug is over there. Mm, I don't know. See, my idea of consistency is when Midjourney creates a picture for you, you're able to like tell Midjourney to focus on everything it had just created. It's able to see what it created. Now, I know that's not technically possible at the moment, but you'd be able to like give it the thumbs up, give it two thumbs up, and you say, I want more of that. And then you'd be able to theoretically rewind in time a few seconds, a few frames, and fast forward a few frames. So that if your character's walking down the street, you can rewind and see what the street looked like that they had just passed. And you could fast forward through time and see what else is down the street and see more people walking past them. I think that's the dream of character consistency or consistency in general. I think I think being able to manipulate time, the same pocket of time, is the real dream of generative AI. Like right now we can, it's basically like having eyeballs or like a telescope into the multiverse. You can see a bunch of different possibilities, but you can't live in those possibilities right now. You can see what if this person looked like this? What if this person looked like that? What if there was a dog made of crystals and glowing fire like okay you'll see four different versions of that idea how do we find one version that we like and live there like that's that's the dream okay this is also really interesting now it's not necessarily my idea so i don't know how much i'll have to say about it but again it was spoken in office hours by david the ceo of midjourney the question came up of would we ever be able to talk to mid-journey in the way we talk to GPT? Could we ever converse with the bot, tell it what we want, and have it tell us either how to create it or, you know, do it for us in a way? And what David took away from that question was really interesting. He doesn't want that. He thinks he's open to having more of an assistant or a helper who could nudge your prompt in certain directions, but he doesn't want you to talk to mid-journey. He doesn't think AIs having personalities is a good thing. And that's fascinating. Who would ever say that in this day and age? Everything you see is about GPT giving a bunch of different voices to, to the AI. You can write custom GPTs to have personalities, the personality you want. You can have it respond in the way you're looking for. There's a bunch of character AI bots that you can talk to. Personalities galore with AI. And here we have the head of arguably the best AI in terms of artistic expression and generation, saying that AI's having personalities is not a good thing. And what he mentioned as being the reason for that thought is he thinks that preserving social energy of humans is really important. And if we had more AIs with personalities, we would be using that social battery on AIs. We would have to put on our own show in front of these new personalities. And he thinks it's important to save those interactions, to save that energy for other humans. And I think that's so heartwarming and such such an important point to make. And it's so crucial that the head of one of these AI companies thinks like that. Sure, you can let other companies create personalities and have significant others and friends in your pocket, but it's really important for one of those companies to be like, no, we shouldn't do that. That's not good. Preserving social energy for humans. That is such a profound concept. And I think that just goes to show you that he really thinks about it a lot because to get to that point to get to that conclusion would take a lot of thinking. You'd have to go through everything good and everything bad about the possibility of having AI friends to eventually say to yourself, yeah, but if I have a lot of AI friends, am I really going to have time for my real friends? And the fact that the brain, the brain is, it's not smart. It doesn't know what it's doing. You know what you're doing and you don't have access to the inner performance cores of the brain. So you're tasking the brain with social interactions. The brain has no idea who it's talking to. It doesn't doesn't care that it's a robot or a human. It's just going to run the program of, you know, upbeat 
enthusiasm, happy to see you, positive talk, curiosity, reciprocal conversation. And if you spend that energy on AIs, you're not going to have any left over for the rest of humanity. And again, it's not my idea, so I don't really have that much more to say about it, but that's just really fascinating to think about. And I think it aligns with my dream of having personal assistance versus like someone above you, someone that you ask for help. You know, you tell it to help you. I don't want to hype up my boss. I don't want to gaslight GPT into doing something for me. I just would like it to be able to help me with what I ask for. I'm telling you, my screen looks so bright right now, but the sky is just, it's pure white. <laughs> like it's, it's so shiny and bright. Imagine the sky was all like, what does a blue sky look like? Oh my gosh. I tell you, I'll take this over the gray, but it's still not good, man. Because a lot of buildings here are gray, so it's just like really bright, gray, dark buildings. <laughs> the opposite of beautiful. Okay, maybe there's two more things I can talk about. And the first relates back to last week's topic about anxiety and pricing, buying new upgrades. And I want to talk about Apple's pricing structure. It's called a pricing ladder. And if you watch any video about new Apple products, I'll give a lot of credit to literally every YouTuber I've come across. They all recognize how big of a problem this is and how anti-human their pricing structure is. So it's called a pricing ladder because they want to get you in at the lowest rung. They want to start you on the ladder. So here's a laptop for $3,000. Oh, what a good deal. But they'll build in a bottleneck so that, oh, for only $250 more, you can erase that bottleneck. Okay, so now you're already up one rung of the ladder, 250 bucks. But then you'll see that to get the best version of what you want, you got to spend $500 more. Okay, whatever. So you go up another rung. But then you find there's more better versions and they only come in a bigger screen. You wanted a 14 inch? Well, if you want the best stuff, you got to get a 16 inch. So you go up another rung, but that's not the best you can get. Now you could fit more cores. So if you really want the best version of the best version, you got to spend another $1,200. $3,000 for like a MacBook Pro baseline with bottlenecks built in so that you don't even want that. The highest MacBook Pro you can get is $7,000. That is a $4,000 difference between getting you in the door and you leaving with what you'd like, the best version. And I was telling my mom about this and she mentioned like that's a lot how car sales work. Like sure, here's your baseline car, $22,000. Oh, but if you want heated seats and driving power steering and whatever else you want in a car, you know, a sunroof. Now you're up to like $45,000 and you're like, well, that's not, those things are not worth that increase in price. But if you want those things, that's what they're priced at. Apple charges like $800 to increase the RAM of a computer. And you can't increase the RAM of an Apple computer without buying it from them. You're like It's not upgradable on your own. And if you were to upgrade your PC, it's like a hundred bucks for RAM. So not only do they overprice it by like 500%, you also can't do it on your own. You need them. Like that's, it's literally pure evil. The only way that that gets brought up in a meeting is with the concept of maximizing profit, not revenue, profit. What do people need? Oh, let's charge them so much for it. Cause like, RAM and storage are what people need. It's super easy and accessible on Windows PCs. So Apple charges you so much for it because they know like that's that's what you want. And if you want it from them, you're doing it their way. And it's just, it's so, yeah, it's evil for sure. Like if I ever met someone who was in charge of those decisions, I don't think you could trust them with anything in your life. I don't care if that's picking you up from the airport I don't care if that's a handshake deal. If you were playing poker with them, I, I wouldn't believe a single word that that person said because they are have been clearly programmed to maximize their interaction with the world. Not only that, they're doing it on behalf of a company, something that doesn't technically exist, but also 
can be represented in court as an entity. So it's like, if you're willing to screw over other humans in support of a company, uh, that guy, that's not my kind of guy. And then I was also trying to explain it to my mom, like, if you went shopping for clothes and you saw a t-shirt you liked, you would notice that a small t-shirt was cheaper than a large t-shirt. The price actually changed based on the size of your clothing. So you're like, fine, I gotta buy a large. Like, okay, whatever, it's a little more expensive. Instead of $20 for the small, it's $30 for the large. But then you pick up the large and it has a really small neck hole. It's like, it's like a pin. Like, you're, you're never gonna get your neck through that. And then you see, well, for $4 more, you can get the large max, which has a normal sized neck hole. And you're like, what? What am I? Why are you doing this? Just sell me the t-shirt. No, no, no. They got to make sure you get the t-shirt that you want on their terms. So you could go from $20 for a small to $30 for a large to $34 for a large with a normal size neck hole. But then they would probably built in something like, well, at $34, you're probably only getting like 10 to 20 washes out of this before the colors fade. But for $45, you can get the large max premium that will keep its color vibrant, saturated for 50 washes. And you're like, okay, like that's what I want. Who wouldn't want that? You don't want your clothes getting ripped up when you're trying to clean them. So from $20 for a small to $45 for what you actually want. Would you have bought the shirt at $45 if it was just $45? Like, maybe. But the experience is so insulting that, like, I can see why so many people use Windows and regular PCs, desktop PCs. If Apple just became a little more cooler with how they interact with customers, wouldn't they win over so many more? Like, why are you trying to profit, maximize profits off of your existing fans rather than trying to find new fans. I guess it's just a strategy that they have their market share. They know people buy Apple products every year. Oof. I don't know. I'm not saying I know what I would do if I was in charge, but I am saying I have an active testimony of wanting to purchase a good piece of technology and being so turned off by their presentation that I'm like, ah, oh, I don't want to deal with this. One, I don't want to support it, and two, I don't want to deal with it. So now I'm just looking at buying individual PC parts to spice up my computer. Oh, but at the same time, I don't really want to do that. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, and I really don't have that much to say about this, but it might be the most interesting piece of this episode. Have you seen the video of this new jellyfish UFO that got released? I think the footage is from 2018. I could be getting my dates a little wrong here, but... And like, it literally looks like a flying jellyfish, maybe like a ball of fist, and then it's got tentacles and it's just floating in the air. Now, I haven't seen the video of this, but supposedly, supposedly, this thing, like, not crashed, not jumped, but like, pierced into water, and then flew up again with no, you know, force of air resistance or gravity around it. Like, it's a traditional UFO in the way it was described, but the video of seeing it, it's so unnerving because it doesn't, it doesn't look fake. I know how stupid that sounds. It looks fake as in, well, we've never seen anything like that, so it's not real, but the, I don't know, is it, uh, it's not night vision. Is it like infrared? Is that how it's picked up on the sensor? It doesn't look fake the way it gets tracked, but you got to be wondering like what, what kind of future technology or side technology, but it's probably future in the sense that it's it's in the future of our technology. It's not, we don't have access to the knowledge that created that thing. So it's in our future, you know, it could be in someone else's past. Time is a flat circle. I get concerned that there hasn't been disclosure of UFOs for a good reason. And that good reason would be, oh, these things are here. They do they don't look friendly. Some of them look like giant jellyfish. We don't know what they are. That would be a little concerning from if you're the leader of the public, all of a sudden you're going to be telling people literally don't look up because like a giant eagle 
for lack of a better metaphor, analogy, whatever, like we could be the prey of something that we don't understand. You're going to have so many people literally never going outside. If the existence of high atmosphere objects is like explained to be real, explained to be true, shown to be a real phenomenon. And you have to call it a phenomenon because it doesn't interact with our understanding of reality. It does things that we can't do. And if it does things that we can't do, does that lessen the, the horror of it all? Because, you know, it's not... Hmm. It's here, but it doesn't act like it's here. Would you be scared of that? I saw one interesting comment that was along the lines of like, now I don't necessarily believe it. I don't think I believe this at all, but like what if there was high atmosphere life and that's what the life looks like, but hearing reports of it, you know, entering water and accelerating, it doesn't seem like those things are alive. It definitely looks like technology. Oh my God. And this other report, and I think I may have mentioned it, you know, a few weeks ago, but like apparently I'll just say apparently the U.S. legitimately has an aircraft recovered that's like, I think, 10 feet in diameter is the report from the outside. But when you go inside, it's the size of a football field. Now, that sounds like the dumbest thing you've ever heard. How could that be possible? And if you told that to someone before the internet, it would be the dumbest thing ever because the odds of you having enough peripheral information to believe that would make zero sense. But thanks to the internet, you can fall down some rabbit holes really easily. And there's a concept of geometry called like Euclidean geometry. I think geometry is the right word. Euclidean and non-Euclidean, which means that the space inside something does not need to be the same size as the space outside of something. I hope I'm explaining that correctly this is a very layman's way of describing it but like there are there are these videos online of someone recreating this mathematical idea inside of a video game where you like literally walk into a hallway and like you you can see inside the hallway and it's just a it's just a door right but then when you walk in your space expands and like if you were to how do I put this if you were to look back out, you would see the original space you came from, but when you're inside that new hallway, you see how much bigger space is really surrounding it. Like, I don't know if dimensions are the right word, like, you don't necessarily go into another dimension, but maybe that is the best way of describing it. Nonetheless, the idea of a spaceship on the outside, sort of like Harry Potter, I think that's one of the jokes in the movie, is it? You set up a little camp and then you walk in and it's it's a giant room. Like that is not necessarily impossible in mathematics. Like there is a lot of history and research into that idea. Now, so you can't really call it science fiction, but now are these reports red herrings or just trying to mess with people? Maybe, but the person it's coming from seems to be a little respectable. And not the type of person to just feed the trolls. But then there's also another piece of the puzzle. And that is, I'll just say apparently, because I don't know anything. There might be another country who is preparing for disclosure ahead of everyone else. And that is why UFO talk is boiled up recently is because the U.S. is realizing like, okay, if they talk about it first, what are they going to say? If the U.S. has been in control of these things for so long, it makes sense that they want to be the first to talk about it. They want to remain in control of the message. Anything we say first will be compared to what gets said after. And the complete opposite is true. Whatever gets said first elsewhere is going to get, like, we're going to get compared to what is already said. So you really want to be first. It's a first impression kind of thing. And again, the really scary thing is, is like, what, oh. What if they're here? What if they're more common? And what if we really don't know? People are okay with the idea of whales and dolphins and sharks and other life in the ocean, deep sea octopus, things that you'll never interact with. Maybe it's because we're above them. We're above sea level. But if something's above us, we built planes, we built jets, 
we rose above the clouds, and if there's something above that that's better than us, that would probably be a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people. But then, like, after, so let's say it's in the news for a week, and then they don't talk about it again for a month. Will people just go back to normal? Probably. There would have to be some really public incidents. I don't know. Let me know what you think. I'd love to hear from you. I think that's it for this episode. Thanks for joining me. I hope you're doing well. Take care. I'll see you next time. Peace.